this is a test. Testing one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Testing one, two, three, four, five. You gonna ask me? This is an, inter inter an interview with Mrs. Fanny Lou Hamer in her home at 721 James Street in Ruleville, Mississippi. The date is, what is the date? April 14th. The date is April 14, 1972. Mrs. Hamer, uh, why don't we begin with something about your, your childhood life? Your, where were you born and what was life like when you were a little girl? Well, I was born 54 years ago on a plantation in the hills, the kind of place that something similar to Hattiesburg, the place where you was from. I was born in one of the, in, I was, in fact, I was the last child of 20 children, six girls and 14 boys. I'm the 20th child. Very poor family, sharecroppers, uh, never had anything. Uh, family life, didn't hardly have food to eat. If you would just wait just a minute, I'm going to see if I can tell you what it's going to look like. Um, my family moved here to Sunflower County when I was two years old. That's 52 years ago. They moved here to Sunflower County. So I was mostly, you know, raised here in the Delta. In fact, from two years old up until now, I've been in the Delta. Uh, my family moved here and we moved on a plantation. Uh, the landowner was named uh, Mr. E.W. Brandon. So we lived on his place until I was uh, grown, but uh, it was just hard. Life was very hard. Uh, we never hardly had enough to eat. Uh, we didn't have clothes to wear. We had to work real hard because I started working when I was about six years old. Didn't have a chance to go to school too much because uh, School would only last about four months at the time, you know, when I was a kid going to school. And most of the time, we didn't have clothes to wear to that. And then if it's any work would come up that we would have to do, you know, like the parent would take us out of the, you know, school to cut stalks or burn stalks or work in deadenings or things like that. It was just really rough as a kid when I was a child. What, what subjects did you like when you were in school, Mrs. Hamer? I loved reading when I was in, when I was in school, when I was a child. I, I loved to read, and in fact, I learned to read real well when I was going to school. Uh, I never had a chance to go to school too long, about six years. But uh, I, can, I believe I can compete today with a kid now that's 12th grade in reading. So how did you spend your life then from uh, when you were finished with your six years of high school? Uh, well, that school. was just in and out of school, in and out of school till I was grown, you know. Just have some months I'd be in school and some I wouldn't. And then you, uh, you worked, of course. What, how did yes. You, what, did you work in the field? Yes, or? I worked in the field. In fact, all the kids around in this Delta worked in the field. You know, there wasn't no other work to do. They didn't have no such thing as factories. These factories is something new. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any factories. There wasn't nothing to do but field work. That's all you had to do. You know, this time of year, uh, well, when there wasn't no cotton to chop, we would uh, be raking corn stalks or doing something like this. But it was never, never a time in April that kids would be in school when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Never a time that a kid would be in school in April. And of course not at all in the summer. Not at all in the summer. But they but they worked, you know. 
because well it was much more work to do at that time than it is now because they don't let the people work in the field now but at that time you didn't get nothing for it but you could work steady because you know you or uh, when the cotton got up big enough to chop you we called it hoeing the cotton because it wasn't chopping after you hold the cotton about two or three times then you would call what they call chopping because it wouldn't be bad then and you know we would just go over it uh, from three to four sometimes five times i remember during the time i was a kid and, and uh, since i've been grown some people would be in the front with the, with the holes chopping cotton and other people would be right behind them and about a week with a sack picking cotton. They just, you know, worked from one season to the other one. It wasn't no such thing as a period, you know, where they had a, a lapse between there. They just chop cotton, chop cotton over and over, you know, when they go over at one time. If they finish up about Monday, well, sometime they'd have a week out and then they'd be right back in that field and go over that cotton again. And they would keep doing that, you see, and then when time come to harvest the crops, it wouldn't be grass and stuff in it. They could pick it and it would be clean, you know, because it wouldn't be like it is now. They use chemicals and all of that. But they didn't use chemicals then. People used the holes to clean that cotton out. Mm -hmm. Let's move forward in time, Mrs. Hamer. When was the first time you really wanted to vote? That was 1962. Tell us about your efforts to vote. Well, uh, I didn't know anything about voting. I didn't know anything about registering to vote. And one night I went to the church and they, they had a mass meeting. And I went to the church and they talked about, you know, how it was our right that we could register and vote. And they were talking about we could vote out people that we didn't want in office. We thought it wasn't right that we could vote them out. And that sounded interesting enough to me that I, I wanted to try it, you know, because I had never, I had never heard until 1962 that uh, black people could register and vote. Never heard that? I never life. heard that. I'd never heard, we hadn't heard anything about registering to vote because if you see this flat land in here, when people would get out of the fields, if they had a radio, they'd be too tired to play it, you know. Mm -hmm. So we didn't know what was going on in the rest of the state even, much less in other places. When you were a child in school, did the, did the books you have say anything about voting or never. democracy? Never. I never heard. I never even heard that that was in the Constitution. I never heard anything about it. In fact, the first time I know was aware that Mississippi had a Constitution was when I tried to register to vote, and they gave me a section of the Constitution of Mississippi to to write, to copy, and then uh, to give a reasonable interpretation of it. I didn't know that, you know, that, that we had that right. When you were growing up, did you, did you know about politics nationally? Like, would you know who the president was? Were you in touch with the... Uh... We, would, we would hear about the president, but it was, you know, kind of, you know, far-fetched from us. Because mm -hmm. I remember... Uh, one president looked like the kind of stands out was uh, President Franklin Delong Roosevelt was a president to kind of stand out because I remember him putting people on job to call WPA and all that yes. when I was a kid. Did you think of him as a friend of the black people when you were growing up? This would be in the Depression? Well, I, I kind of thought it, you know, I, from what my parents, I would hear my father talking about. And I'd, I'd hear him talk about sometimes Republicans and Democrats, but I didn't, I didn't know, wasn't aware too much of what it meant. Now, when you first tried to vote, where, where was that? Was that in uh, What I, When I first tried to register? Yes, ma'am. Well, when I first tried to register, it was in Inanola. I went to uh, Inanola on the 31st of August in 1962. That was to try to register. So when we got there, it was 18 of us went that day. So when we got there, it was, you know, people there to, with guns and, and just a lot of strange looking people to us. And 
we went on in the circuit clerk's office and uh, he asked us what did we want and we told him what we wanted. We wanted to try to register. He told us all of us would have to get out of there except two. So I was one of the two persons that remained inside to try to register. And uh, another young man named Mr. Ernest Davis. So we stayed in to take the literacy test. So the registrar gave me the uh, 16th section of the Constitution of Mississippi. He pointed it out in the book, you know, and told me to, to look at it and then cop it down just like I saw it in the book. Put a period where a period's supposed to be a comma and all of that. And then after I copied it down, he told me right below there to give a real reasonable interpretation and interpret what I had read, and that was impossible. I tried to give it, but I didn't even know what it meant, much less to interpret it. Lawyers don't know what it means. Well, I didn't know. Yes. So what happened then? You were arrested, weren't you? Well, you when we got started back to Rueville, we were stopped by a state highway patrolman and the city police, and they ordered us to get off of the bus. And we got off of the bus, and then uh, they told us to get back on the bus and go back to Indianola. And we got back on the bus, and we went back to Indianola. We got back to Indianola. The man was driving. They, they arrested one of the men that was with us, which was Mr. Lawrence Giot. They arrested him, and then they uh, told this man who drove us down there that his bus had too much yellow on it. And they charged, they fined him a hundred dollars, but they finally cut his fine down to thirty dollars. And then we had enough to pay his fine, and we come on in to move it. But you didn't spend the time in jail that time. I didn't spend. I didn't go to jail even that time. We just went back, and it was just one of the people arrested, and that was the man that was with us. Now let's go back a little bit to when you first heard about voting. Who? Uh, was that Mr. Robert Moses and, and uh, that's the right. nonviolent coordinating committee that's people? That's right. That's right. See, well, he was there in person. That's where you. I, w I was with him on the bus the day that we went down to register. Uh, it was with Robert Moses. That's right. Now, when you when you heard about it first, though, in the schoolhouse back before you tried to register, when you first heard about voting, at did the you church. hear? It? Yes, the church. Did you hear it from Robert Moses? I heard it from uh, Robert Moses and another man named Jim Foreman. He was from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and he told us, you know, that we had a right, and it was another man from COA, Congress of Racial Equality, and his name was David Dennis, and he all of them talked about it that night, and after they talked about it, it just made enough sense to me that I wanted to try. Did they tell you it might be dangerous in Mississippi to try to vote? They didn't tell us that it might be dangerous. Did you think it was dangerous the first time you tried? I, I had a feeling that, I, I don't know why, but I just had a feeling because the morning I left home to go down to register, I carried some extra shoes and, uh, you know, a bag because I said if I'm arrested or anything, I'll have some extra shoes to put on. So I had a feeling something might happen. I just didn't know. I didn't know it was going to be as much involved as it finally was, but I had a feeling that we might be arrested. Now, what happened when you got back? Did uh, did anything at all happen? Were you Did you lose your home? Well, when we got back, I went on out to where I had been staying uh, for 18 years, and uh, the landowner had talked to my husband and told him I had to leave the place. and. Uh, my little girl, the child that I raised, met me and told me that, you know, the landowner was mad and I might have to leave. So uh, during the time that my husband was talking about it, I was back in the house and uh, the landowner dro drove up and asked him had I made it back. And uh, he told him I had. And I got up and walked out on the porch. And he told, my, uh, told me, did Pap tell me what he said? And I told him he did. He said, well, I mean that. You will have to go down and withdraw your registration or you will have to leave this place. And I didn't call myself saying nothing smart, but I, I couldn't understand it. And I answered in the only way I could and told him that I didn't go down there to register for him. I went down there to register for myself. And this seemed like it made him mad. Mm -hmm. I told him that. 
So you had to leave right away? I had to leave that same night. Then your husband stayed on to finish the crop? He stayed on because he told him the next morning that, you know, if he left, he wouldn't give us any of our belongings. But if he'd help him to harvest the crop, well, he'd give us, you know, the rest of our things. Had this planter been fair to you before or, or not? Not too fair. That's one of the reasons I wanted, it was important to me to try to go and register because he, he hadn't been fair. Now, uh, we had we had worked on, I had worked on that place for 18 years. My husband was there before I went there. So we worked a while with his father, but his father seemed to have been a better man than the son. What kind of work did you do on that plantation? Well, I was a timekeeper and then a sharecropper, too. Where did you go then, Mr. Hamer, after you had to leave the house on the plantation? I had to come, I come out here to town and it's right across having a made highway and I started staying with some people, Mr. and Mrs. Tucker, and then my husband got frightened and carried me to my nieces. And after he carried me there, then they shot in that house. When I was staying with those people, they shot in that house. The Tucker's house? In the Tucker's house. So you were turned down then. Your registration effort failed. It failed. When did it finally succeed? Well, uh, after coming back to Rueville, I went to Tallahatchie County and stayed a while. After my husband got so frightened, I went to Tallahatchie County and stayed a while. And when I come back, we moved here in Rueville. It was at 626 East Lafayette Street. We moved in on the 3rd of December. And I went back on the 4th of December to take the literacy test again. 1962. 1962, on the 4th of December. So that was one Monday. And the, the registrar gave me another section of the Constitution with the 49th section of the Constitution of Mississippi was dealing with the House of Representatives. So he told me to copy that down and to give a reasonable interpretation. I copied that, but I had been, we had got hold of one of the, you know, of the Constitution of Mississippi and had been able to study it. And people, you know, some of the people from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee would help us to try to interpret it. So that time I give a uh, reasonable enough interpretation when I went back to see about it in January I had passed that literacy test so I didn't take the test but twice. I see. So then you voted. When, when did you first vote? Well the first attempt that I tried to vote I didn't really get to vote. I went up to vote that was in a, in a, in a primary election because it was in August. And we went up to vote that day, and I didn't have two poll tax receipts because I hadn't been paying poll tax, mm -hmm. and I didn't have two prior years. And uh, they told me I couldn't vote because I didn't have two poll tax receipts. Mm -hmm. So you, you couldn't vote that time, and then when did you finally cast your vote? The first, first vote I cast, I cast the first vote for myself because I was running for Congress. My first vote I voted Is that for myself. Right? And that was what year? That was in 1964. And who were you running against? Jamie Whitten. Jamie Whitten, yes, 1964. Well, when did you get involved uh, actively in, in the civil rights movement, other than simply trying to vote? When did you become a civil rights worker? Well, all of that went together because as soon as I was fired from that plantation, I started right away then working on voter registration. And it, you know, just kind of materialized together. I didn't have anything else to do. You Did you work for SNCC? I worked for SNCC. SNCC. I worked, in fact, I worked not only for SNCC, I worked for COFO, Council of Federated Organizations. So all organizations was together. Right. But I was first hired to work for SNCC. Yeah, that was $10 a week if they had If they the had the money, that's right. Did SNCC often have the $10? Not when I first started. How did, how, how did you SNCC field workers survive with so little money in those? Well, it, it was really survive because so many times we didn't have nothing. And um, there was a few friends, you know, would help kind of tide us over. And this man I was talking about, 
uh, you doing the interview with him, he was like a real father to me because they would, you know, try to keep our gas bills and the important bills paid. His name was? Mr. Amsey Moore. Mr. Amsey Moore. Yeah. Talk about uh, your activities as a voter registration worker in, in the early period. Well, it was it was rough, you know, because we would go to places uh, to go in to do voter registration in places, and we'd talk to people, you know, and we would tell them, you know, we'd walk the streets in different little areas and we would tell them we was coming back the next day and by the next day somebody would be done got to them and they wouldn't want to talk with us you know and this kind of stuff it would be kind of some some days would be disgusting some very disappointing and then we go to churches and they occasion along they was burning up churches and these are the kind of things we face with who would uh get to the people you talk to? Well, you know, like the landowners and the white people would get to them and then they would, you know, tell them. And we was working with food too. We would, you know, trying to get people to get commodities. All of that went together because at that point it was really rough. Yeah. What about the Citizens Council? What activity did they have to prevent you from voter registration work? Or weren't they active? Before? Well, um, they was active course we couldn't tell what group was doing what you know we just know we would be harassed and we know cars would be passing the house loaded with white men and trucks would be passing there with guns hanging up in the back uh, they would walk the street sometime with dogs and uh, we know it was something but we didn't know what group it was now, you didn't really have much luck in those early years of voter registration? No, it was it was really rough. How mm -hmm. many people do you think you carried down? To? Not too many, but, it, but uh, it was a few that would go and, you know, wouldn't, we carried some down and then they would be pressured and they'd go back and withdraw theirs. And then occasionally long we cast some down that would refuse to go and, you know, they made a uh, kind of what I would say was the example out of those of us that did say we wasn't going back. You know, we was punished to the fullest, you know, to keep other people disgusted, to keep them from going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who felt freest to go among the black people? Was it the old people or the young people or the self-employed? Or Well, um, in this area, it was more people my age and it was young people it always the movement in this area has all always been grown people yeah. it, it it we you know we've never had a, a strong movement with youngsters here and still don't have the folk mostly that go out in the front is uh older people why do you think that I, I i i really don't know but uh from the beginning of the movement here, you know, like uh, Brother Joe McDonald, he's dead now, Mr. Herman Sism, Mrs. Hattie Sism, Mrs. Mrs. Joe McDonald, all of them was elderly people. They, they older than I am, but they were the one that stood up in the front and, and stood there. Uh, people like Brother Joe McDonald stood there till he died, you know, with all kinds of pressures, because the night they shot in the Tuckers, they shot in his house and the Sism's too, because two girls were shot that night at the Sism's house, but they stood their ground, and it was it was uh, older people, mm -hmm. you know. And yeah, that's, I, didn't, I didn't suspect that. I thought mostly it was very young. No, it was young people worked with us, you know, the SNCC workers, but of all the work was going on was carried out by grown people in this age. Were most all of the SNCC workers in those early years, were they black or were there some white SNCC? Well, at the beginning, they was all black, and then the whites began to come in. So it was blacks and whites. Mm -hmm. You mentioned COFO. We, we associate COFO with uh, Freedom Summer, but COFO actually got started before then, didn't it? It did. It got started before we Do you know anything about the origin of COFO and how it got started and when it did? Well, I don't know exactly when it got started, uh, what time it got started, but I know it was an organization like 
the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and the, and the NAACP and the uh, Congress of Racial Equality that decided to get together and form uh, uh, this COFO was an umbrella for all of the organizations so it just wouldn't be in one name. But at that point, SNCC was doing most of the work anyway. Uh, usually COFO was SNCC. And then that's, that's right. That's right. Uh, it's been said that uh, most SNCC, or many SNCC workers, and many COFO workers too, uh, thought that the uh, Justice Department under uh, Bobby Kennedy was going to offer protection for civil rights workers and voting rights workers. Did you have that understanding that, that the people from the Justice Department would, would uh, keep the uh, white police and the Klansmen and the council people? away and offer protection during your voting rights efforts? But uh, I thought that, but we never did get, you know, no protection. It's, you know, we would file suits, you know, when people would be harassed to go to jail. we you know, go into court and all of that, but nobody was never really, but the FBI's, and I guess you know about them too. But anyway, but that was the only people they would send in, you know, to investigate something after something would be done happen. I know about the FBI, but for the record, was the FBI the friend of the black people, or would you say they were more the friend of the white establishment? I, I, I feel like they was more of a friend of the white establishment than they were uh, the uh, black people. Yeah, that's... And I still feel that way. But originally, you, you thought, as a, a voter worker, that justice would offer some support or some help, and that uh, John Doerr or... Yeah, we, in fact, we get in touch with, uh, with the Justice Department, uh, Mr. John Doerr, and the Attorney General at that time was uh, Senator Kennedy, uh, because... I, I really believe that, I believe with all my heart that they would protect you, you know, until a certain length of time. And so much went on that it, nothing was done about it. And I had a kind of little leery feeling that would they really protect us or not. But we, you know, that didn't stop us from doing what we felt that we had to do. Yes. Among yourselves, how did you explain? the uh, reluctance of uh, the federal government to come in and support you in your efforts to get the rights of a citizen of the United States? Well, um, we would just talk about it among ourselves and uh, uh, some of them would finally just give up on it and say it wasn't nothing going to be done. That's what I've seen a lot of people, black young people and white young people become disgusted and disillusioned with the whole setup, you know. They said there ain't, no, ain't nobody going to do nothing, you know, and all of that. Yes, yes. Well, <clears throat> what about Freedom Summer? What were you doing during the summer of 1964? What was your activity like? And just talk generally about that, that summer in Mississippi. Well, uh, that was doing the same thing, voter registration and having mass meetings trying to get more people involved and bringing more people out uh, at Dubs because at that time, you know, it wasn't no such thing as 18-year-old votes. So we was trying to get as many adults as we could to register as possible. And that's what we worked on mostly that whole summer was voter registration and uh, getting as many people as we could involved. You had freedom schools too. Yes. Uh -huh. what, what did you do in the freedom schools? Well, they teach, you know, because, see, it was a lot of people that couldn't. I didn't go much to the schools because I was out on the road most of the time, going to mass meetings in different areas and different places, you know, like they want me to come from place to place to speak, and that's what I was doing. Yes, yes. But the Freedom Schools taught uh, about the Constitution and about citizenship. That's right. And voting. That's right. They had uh, community centers, too. That's right. They had community centers, and uh, some of the white kids and the blacks was teaching in these freedom schools and, uh, you know, holding citizenship education uh, classes across because 
in this uh, Delta, it's a high rate of illiteracy. It's a lot of people still here who can't read and write. Yes, yes. Did you know uh, Andrew Goodman or uh, uh, Michael Schwerner or I know I know Michael Schwerner and James Chaney real well. I didn't know Andy as well as I know uh, Mickey and uh, James Chaney. Did you see them shortly before they they were killed? I had been to Meridian to go to a meeting that they invited me to, you know, uh, a couple of weeks before they went to Oxford, Ohio. Let's rest, let's rest a minute.